night's session with the keynote talk. Um, this was a really fun thing to organize. Uh, Wallace, myself, um, Ed, and Vito, we, we really didn't have too many problems whatsoever because the person that we chose, Mark Kirshner, was like a no-brainer. This is somebody who really I think exemplarizes um, dynamic cell quantitative um, analysis in all possible ways. I think he is also a wonderful um, example of somebody who has studied so many different aspects of the cell during his long career. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about his history. Um, he got his PhD from Berkeley and then did a, uh, a postdoc at Berkeley uh, before then doing another postdoc, short postdoc at Oxford, and then took on a faculty position at Princeton. From Princeton, he moved to UCSF, and I think this is where he really set up um, this whole new world of biology as we know it, which is really taking um, sort of biochemical assays and uh, drawing principles, uh, in particular principles related to self-organization of uh, really fundamental processes. And so some of these uh, sort of breakthrough things that he did include, includes really discovering that cyclins uh, are really the key organizers of uh, the cell cycle. Um, together with um, uh, Andrew Murray, he, he discovered, he uh, sort of characterized that process. But also, which was, I think, I mean, that was just a, an amazing um, period, I think, of the recognition of the role of these cyclins. But uh, Mark took it to a whole nother level by showing that ubiquitin um, is modulating uh, the cyclins. Uh, they're just really targeting them for destruction at key places during the cell cycle to modulate movement through this system in a dynamic way. Um, and then he went on using biochemical approaches to purify um, some of the key components of the cell cycle, including cyclin B and APC. Um, but in a whole different area of biology, he also did some incredible work. And uh, as all of you probably know, he was the one who really described dynamic instability together with Tim Mitchison, who was, was a postdoc or graduate? He was a student in, in the lab. Um, and that, again, was another sort of breakthrough conceptualization that just changed everything in terms of the way we think about the cytoskeleton as a dynamic self-organizing system. But he's also somebody who thinks hard about evolution and has, been do, uh, has, has thought deeply about the principles that drive vertebrate organization, vertebrate body plan. Um, he's written a couple books with John, together with John Gurdon describing um, sort of evolutionary principles that drive evolution. And I think we're going to hear a little bit about some of these principles tonight. I'm not sure, though. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, not surprisingly, Mark has received a lot of uh, uh, recognition through, uh, by the community. Uh, he won the Gardner um, Foundation's International Award. He won the E.B. Wilson Award uh, Medal. Um, he's a member of the National Academy. Um, I also want to say that he was the founding chair of the Department of Systems Biology at Harvard, which again um, has uh, been very influential in, um, you know, sort of pushing, opening up this whole new world of biology that we're really part of. So it's a great pleasure to have Mark give us this keynote talk. Well, thanks very much, Jennifer, and I thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. Um, lunch today happened to be excellently sitting down with the people who were the main organizers, and they were trying to think about all sorts of things about the future, and the name of the meeting, of the meeting was one of the things they thought about. And I thought, just, why not just call it interesting biology? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, uh, uh, 
And then if someone just, you know, doesn't attend the meeting, you could say, well, I, I guess I understand that. You're just not interested in interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think it's, it's terrific that uh, I think somehow uh, um, bringing the quantitative aspect, in addition to its inherent value, it also brings in people with different backgrounds and, uh, and stirs things up a little bit. They ask naive questions. Most of them are stupid, <laughs> but most of ours are stupid as well. But we consider it because they're, they're, they're physicists because they're stupid, but it's not really. It's, it's just that you have to ask lots of questions in order to ask interesting questions, I think. So um, anyway, so let me uh, talk about a problem which I th we have had a bit of a prelude for a part of what I'm going to talk at the end uh, from uh, Ying Lu, who I hope you will get a chance to meet, who uh, was the main person who did the work here by, by far. And um, it's a problem I particularly like because, uh, and it didn't start out that way. I mean, it started out as a, an investigation into some mechanistic biochemistry. And, uh, but we recognized from the very beginning that the mechanistic biochemistry uh, was very hard to do in a conventional way. But we, we were rewarded uh, by, uh, I think, something more profound and maybe more general. So that's sort of what I, I want to share with you. And I think it's probably something I've learned maybe uh, throughout my career, since uh, as Jennifer was referring to the, the ancient history as well, is that if you have an interesting biochemical process or an interesting biological process, no matter how complicated it is, or maybe especially if it is complicated, uh, is usually, it's usually worth investigating it because something, it's not just complicated to make us, uh, uh, to, to frustrate us. There's usually some principle lurking beneath it. So maybe you'll have a sense of whether there is here. So, uh, so this is now, uh, so, so we know that, um, that uh, we talk about choices and, and we're not the only ones who have to worry about choices and sometimes we make the right ones and sometimes we make the wrong ones. Some people think this is the right choice, some people think this is the wrong choice. But the, uh, the fact is that the choices have consequences. And so therefore biology has to be very careful about what kind of choices it makes, whether to, you know, to, to hydrolyze the right or the wrong substrate, whether uh, to differentiate or whether in fact to carry out some process. And so uh, it's all about choices. And the biggest concept I think that's driven um, a lot of the sort of questions about recognition and choices uh, really goes back to this guy, Emil Fischer, who probably nobody here knows, but um, he, uh, you know, he was really responsible for um, the idea of the peptide bond, probably more than anyone, and the discovery of a lot of amino acid structures and synthesis of those things. And he said, uh, he came up with this kind of idea about enzymes uh, he says, yeah, we'll say that an enzyme and, a, and, a, uh, and a, some substrate must fit like a lock and key in order to be able to exert a chemical effect on each other. So he had the view of complementarity. And even there was, a, there was kind of nice things about this thing, because you could always keep sticking different keys in the lock. So like, like enzymes, they could be used over and over and over again. And if it's the wrong key, of course, it doesn't work the lock. So, And... Um, and so that we, this is very ingrained in us. You know, we, we think of enzymes basically binding their, their right substrates because uh, they fit. And this is both an ener energetic consideration as well as just a structural consideration because, because they fit, they, can, uh, they have large surfaces in common with each other and maybe allowing all sorts of bonds to take place. And of course we have DNA and RNA and DNA and RNA and RNA and, and uh, uh, where we also have a, a very uh, uh, exquisite sense of complementarity. Again, uh, elicited by a sort of chemical principles of inter energetics of these interactions. Since we're here in this room with a friend looking over our shoulder, we should really pay homage to this complementarity. Um, all right, so the more we got into it, the more that seemed to be a satisfying a idea. Uh, so as X-ray structures of enzymes came out, it wasn't just kind of the speculation of Emil Fischer, but 
There were actual pictures you could see that indicated how, how amazingly complementary these things were. And antibodies and antigens also had the same kind of, of, uh, of fit. And uh, proteins and RNA, they also had a kind of complementarity that really allowed you to understand the structural interactions and the specificity which takes place here. That is, uh, the, it, this will bind to a certain sequence, but not bind to another sequence. And then, of course, we also have uh, complementarity in, uh, if you heard of some I mentioned earlier, uh, between uh, MHC and the peptide and the T cell receptor and two different cells. Now, there's a part, however, the satisfying all this is, there's a paradox, which is, uh, I'm sure, bothered all, so many of you, uh, which is that the sequences that define the complementarity uh, are, seem too short. At least that's not the way I would design biology. You know, I mean, to have a situation with a transcription factor binding thousands of sites on the DNA when you only want a few sites to be actually functional. So there can't be any reason why you can't make a bigger site on the DNA. And, and the peculiarity is that transcription factor binding sites in eukaryotes are shorter on average than in prokaryotes where there's you know, less DNA and fewer transcription factors. So that makes even less sense. Kinase binding sites are sometimes only two or three or amino acids uh, long, which certainly would mean that every protein gets multiply modified. And, um, and from our point of view, from our perspective, as, as, uh, as, uh, as Jennifer said, that um, uh, we uh, identified something called the anaphase promoting complex and purified it and characterized it and showed that it was important in the, uh, in the degradation of substrates and mitosis and, uh, and also other places too. And, but the sequences that were the specificity sequences that were required were trivially small. And, uh, and so that, that bothered me as well. And these T cell receptor MHC interactions are weak and transient. And that, those are very consequential. So, um, so, okay, so I'll take you into proteolysis, because that's uh, probably, uh, maybe you don't want to go there, but it's, uh, it's uh, an interesting problem in biology. It's in cells that are not dividing every uh, 30 minutes and uh, diluting their contents uh, exponentially. Um, uh, proteolysis plays a very, very big role, and it plays a big regulatory role as well. There are about 650 enzymes that recognize proteins in the human cells for protein degradation. There's probably another 200 proteins that are involved in, the, in this whole process as well. That's a lot of proteins. The, a lot of ATP is being consumed, and, and, uh, uh, but the specificity sequences are small and degenerate. And uh, I think somewhere I said that the, the you know, the, we think there are about 100 substrates I have approximately for the anaphase promoting complex, but there are 11,000 proteins in the genome that have these sequences. So it's, you know, it's, it's simplifying it by a factor of two. And if you look at those sequences, they're either one of them has lysine and, uh, and uh, uh, aspartate, and the other has... Uh, uh, arginine, and it's unlikely that these are buried inside of proteins. At least all of 11,000 are buried inside of proteins. So, okay, so, uh, so coming back to, you know, recognition and how this whole process works, I, so this is just probably what you need to know. That there's this enzyme which is the specificity enzyme, and it will take a target protein and some other stuff and add this 7 kilodalton protein uh, to the target protein, uh, and this protein is called ubiquitin, and there can be multiple sites on the protein where it's added, and also the ubiquitin adds to the ubiquitin to make chains, and some combination of the number of places it's ubiquitinated and length of these chains uh, allows the proteasome, which is kind of the universal wearing blender, which will basically chew up anything. And it's good that it's so nonspecific in a way because it's used again in the immune system to display um, cellular peptides, uh, in, in, uh, you know, which is very important in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in immunity. So, uh, so that's the basic 
chemistry there. Now, the anaphase promoting complex, APC, is about a 1 in 0.5 megadalton complex of about 15 subunits, very big thing. And, uh, but just for, for what we need to know today, the, um, that enzyme uh, will, uh, uh, will degrade uh, proteins in an ordered way in the exit from, from uh, metaphase. And um, this order is essentially uh, a measure of the specificity it has for that. So it's most specific uh, and, and reacts most readily with securin, which is a protein that's involved in, uh, re regulates chromatid separation. And, uh, and uh, less well with the ORA, which is an important uh, kinase in, in uh, cell division. And so these things are le is a measure of uh, how important it is that the order at least is imposed by the substrate specificity. And of course, as I mentioned, there are lots of proteins that aren't going to be degraded by this thing, so it has to distinguish these things. Okay, as I said, these substrates are uh, these two sequences that are used uh, principally for, uh, for substrates, which are sufficient, I mean, which are necessary but not sufficient, so they can't, you can, if you destroy them, you can, uh, you lose the capacity to be degraded by APC, but if you put them on another protein, they won't necessarily work, um, are very small. Okay, so uh, again, as I say, there is about a little over 12,000 of these proteins, and on top of it, this is another thing to worry about. I mean, it's not only that there are a lot of nonspecific proteins, but the total concentration of these nonspecific proteins in the cell is about one millimolar compared to a 100 uh, nanomolar concentration of APC. So all these things, even if they bound to the, the site there uh, and didn't get degraded, uh, are certainly going to inhibit the degradation of the known substrates. So this seems like an intolerable situation. And, uh, and so not only, the first question is how would this work? And secondly, why would it be built this way? So I think you should always ask that question, even though you're told in biology, you know, there's no ultimate reason for anything. Uh, I think when you find things that are so intricate of design like this, that have been conserved for a billion years, almost unchanged, it's probably not a bad guess to think that they're, not that they were some frozen accident, but that they're continually under selection for the function they presently have which means that we don't understand it, which means it's worth studying. Uh, now, this is another feature which uh, Ying uh, pointed out, which was uh, the, the, um, what happens is uh, the, uh, to add these ubiquitins to the target protein, um, the protein has to come on and off several times and bind the, uh, uh, the enzyme. To, you know, it doesn't happen in one just shot which we'll show you in a moment, but uh, his point is that, uh, that, and there are also these deubiquinating enzymes. To make matters worse, I told you how hard it was even to get these things ubiquinated, but there are also these enzymes around that remove the ubiquitin. Now, if it takes more than one step to add all these ubiquitins, and you've got 11,000 or 12,000 proteins ready to bind to that site, it's going to delay to a minimum number of enzymes it's going to delay the time it takes to return to make another, uh, add another ubiquitin. So you can show that as, a, as you increase substrate, co uh, uh, substrate concentration, uh, basically the absolute speed of this degradation process will eventually go to zero. So this kind of competition plus the, the presence of these deubiquitating enzymes just makes it unlikely that you'll get to the point of actually being able to degrade the protein. Okay. So let's talk about modeling and then let's forget about it for a moment. Uh, um, I mean, you can get very nice data uh, in vitro here of, uh, where well, this is an experiment where you look at the amount of ubiquitin that's added to a, the protein over time. You see is the original unubiquitated substrate uh, disappears in intermediate form, and at a longer time, you get higher and higher amounts of ubiquitin. 
But this is misleadingly simple because something that has five ubiquinins on it, you don't know if that's a chain of five ubiquinins. You don't know if it's, a, if it's five monoubiquinins or three and two. So this thing kind of uh, really um, uh, is, is, is much more complicated than this simple biochemical assay would show. And if you look at all the reactions even to put these things on, um, you would need to have the correct mechanism first. You're not going to infer it from doing modeling. Um, there's a simplification of using silicene mutants, but uh, we now think that's risky. Some steps are too fast to fit precisely. There are too many parameters. So overfitting is uh, very likely, and you lose information because this reaction is not synchronous. So any given time you take a, a sample, you're getting a mixture out of it, and each of these things itself is a mixture. So I don't think it's something that I would recommend ordinary differential equation chemical pro, um, modeling as a process. So what can we do then? Well, so um, we decided to wade into the question of trying to look at single substrates over time by single molecule measurements. And this is basically the way this experiment was set up. And uh, a lot of the ingenuity in this experiment was um, the, the efforts that Ying made to uh, lower the, to passivate the substrates and reduce background. And you'll see some of the, the um, ways in which this was done. But first we put a substrate tethered to glass uh, through biotin and, and streptavidin on the surface here. So we have a substrate tethered here. And uh, we have a dye, a chemical dye. All these things are done with chemical dyes, uh, which are bright, and they photobleach less uh, rapidly. And uh, so we have a chemical dye attached here. And then we took the ubiquitin molecule. We can remove all the ubiquitin from an extract. It was done in extracts, but I will say something right now about extracts. To our utter surprise that um, all the experiments that we did in extracts, when we repeated them in, with a purified reconstituted system where everything was recombinant or purified, we got almost identical results. So um, uh, some, most of what I'll show you what I think we've done with the purified system, but it, they're, they're really identical, and I was totally you know, happy but surprised by that. Okay, so the ubiquitin itself uh, we modified so we could put a substrate on a specific place on the ubiquitin molecule, remove all the ubiquitin, show that this modified ubiquitin carries out the reactions with perfectly the same kinetics. And then the E3 enzyme, the antiphase promoting complex, APC, we labeled with an antibody, uh, which also had a chemical dye on it. Um, now, one feature of this, of course, uh, is that uh, the... Um, uh, Non-specific binding to the surface, we could uh, reduce in, in our consideration by the fact that we labeled the substrate. So we're only interested in interactions where the APC dye and the substrate dye overlap. And you know, in other words, we we did that. That actually simplified the signal to noise in this process. All right. So okay, there we are. Um, I want to just give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, so on the up, upper here, we, on the left side, we have uh, no substrate presence. And we have, uh, I'll show you the APC channel. And with the APC channel, on the left, you'll just see what the background looks like. On the right, you'll see um, a wild type substrate, geminin, which is, uh, not, uh, which is uh, not fluorescent. So those spots you see there are, are background. Um, and, uh, and you'll see the APC binding and coming off and, 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 you know, as much as you can tell in this. So, so this is what the APC channel looks like I mean, without a substrate. Things come on and off. And with the substrate, you can see there's much more stuff. And as you'll, but in fact, in this kind of field, there would never be a substrate molecule. I mean, we, we, we'd always be able to detect uh, there'd be no ambiguity of something that was bound, it wasn't bound to the substrate, because there is some background. In the ubiquitin channel, oops, yeah, let's do this. 
the ubiquitin channel has a little bit of ubiquitin coming on. Now, with ubiquitin, so you build up with some ubiquitin, but the, um, here, let me just do it here. You'll see that the ubiquitin begins to pile up more and more because we're getting more and more ubiquitin on the molecule. So, okay, so that's kind of, uh, can't learn much from this just by looking at it, but, um, and the passivation, just to show you what we were able to do with uh, passivation uh, conditions, uh, some of which we figured out, some of which were accidental, but we could, you know, we can share that with everybody. And, you, and that makes the whole thing much easier. This is what the, uh, uh, the standard public passivation methods are. Okay, so I'll show you one uh, trace. We have probably somewhere between 50 and 100,000 traces. So I won't show you all of them. And, um, and this, we'll, we'll look at two things here. We'll look at the ubiquitin that's added and the APC. And so uh, you see what happens here. Um, there's uh, the APC comes on, and when it comes on, then uh, a number of ubiquitins are added. So this is, the, this is you know, quantitatively accurate. I mean, there may be about seven ubiquitins are added, then it comes off and not much happens, and then it comes on again, and there's some more ubiquitins added, but you'll see that it's on longer here than it is here, and there are fewer additional ubiquitins added. That's important. Um, now, this is also what's true, is that uh, there are a number of non-productive complexes that form. Here, the APC is bound for a much longer period of time, and all we see is the loss of the um, ubiquitin by the deubiquinating enzymes. And there's another non-productive reaction. I think it's less than 50% of non-productive. And then we see it come back on again, and more ubiquitins are added. And uh, then it comes off, uh, then it comes on again, and, uh, and eventually it comes on again, and there's more ubiquitins added. So you see it comes on, and more ubiquitins, and then maybe more ubiquitins. So in any case, that's one sort of, that's what the data looks like. And then, of course, you know, there's the analysis of that. So taking a bunch of traces and superimposing them, what we see is that in the first maybe 100 milliseconds, there's, um, and I should say that this, one of the reasons we were able to get such uh, exquisite data is because this reaction is uh, slow, both in vivo and, and, and extra in the purified system. Um, so that means we could really collect a lot of photons. So it's all about signal to noise, and you know, if you collect a lot of photons, you can get accurate data. So you can see in the first, a kinetic thing. We get this large number, maybe in this say about an average of about seven ubiquitins are added. And then the next step uh, is, uh, is much, much slower, and it goes up from maybe seven to nine ubiquitins. I mean, on the average, you know, it's obviously the traces are, represent a lot of different behaviors. So these are kind of, um, first of all, this was the back, you know, backwards from what at least I thought was going to happen. I thought that when the substrate bound, the slow step would be adding ubiquitin to the lysines on the protein, and the fast step would be um, the elongation. But it's decidedly not that way. It's just the other way around. That is, when it binds the first time, it adds lots of ubiquitins. And, uh, and we actually know that it's mostly adding monoubiquitins. So I won't go through all the experiments, but um, we know that very clearly. So it's adding, maybe if it adds seven, maybe one or two of them will be diubiquitins. The others will be all monoubiquitins on various lysines on the protein. Um, we know that good substrates add more ubiquitins in the first encounter than poor substrates. Um, so, for example, uh, we saw something like seven or something for uh, Secturin or Geminin, but if we used... Uh, 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 cyclin A, that might be two or three that were added. So it's a much poorer substrate. Uh, for circurin, it takes on the order of three or four encounters to add enough substrates for degradation. And, um, and the other thing is uh, something which I'll demonstrate in a moment. So when we uh, measure the on rate and the off rate using uh, this, these single molecule measurements, uh, the off rate is simply the time in which the APC 
is bound to the substrate, or inverse to the time, over the time. And the on rate is just the, uh, the, the period of time between addition of APC, binding of APC to the substrate. So it's simple. When we, when we did that, and we compared that to other measurements, uh, we found we were off by two orders of magnitude. That is, uh, uh, but we immediately realized why that was the case. In fact, it was, uh, and that was that um, we, of course, know exactly how many ubiquitins are on the substrate when an APC is coming, is coming off or when it's coming back on. So we could actually measure the on rate and the off rate uh, as a function of the number of ubiquitins on the molecule. And as this shows is that when you increase the number of ubiquitins on the molecule, uh, the off rate goes down about tenfold, and the on rate goes up about tenfold. So together you get about the hundredfold difference. So it's really that ubiquitin is, uh, ubiquitination of the protein is delaying the off, uh, the, uh, retarding its coming off, and increasing the rate at which it goes on. Now, it's more common to have things that affect off rates because that's the chemistry of what you're seeing. The on rate is usually something related to diffusion. But um, in fact, when you have a collision, it's not just uh, what the time of, of two molecules colliding is, but what the target size is when they do collide. And so, uh, that, and that, uh, and so you must, it must be an antenna that, uh, a larger target size when the ubiquitin is added. All right, I think this is probably enough for you to immediately understand why the process works the way it does. So maybe I just could skip on to the next subject, or maybe I should tell you why. Uh, uh, so let's see what this peculiar process is actually doing. APC interacts with a pseudo substrate, non substrate. And uh, what I haven't told you is that uh, it binds to APC, that we, um, good and bad substrates alike, if they have this D box or Ken box with the same affinity, roughly the same affinity. So already it, vi it violates our understanding. We, just, we had actually found this out earlier, but I mean, before we did these, these, these kind of experiments, but, but certainly we can say that from some of the experiments we did here. So already it's not what you think. You know, if you, we think that a good substrate should bind more tightly than a bad substrate. But I've told you they bind at the same rate. And uh, they come off at the same rate, as long as there's no ubiquitination. So uh, I hope you can keep all this kind of uh, puzzling stuff in your head, because I'll make it clear. So, so this uh, non-substrate comes off. It's quickly released because it hasn't added any ubiquitin. So once it adds ubiquitin, it changes the affinity. And also, it won't come back on very well either. And so as a result, even if it added one ubiquitin, it probably would lose it before it rebound. So it's unubiquinatable. Now, if APAC acts with a real substrate, whose lysines are in the right configuration so that they can actually be ubiquinated, Ubiquitin can be added. That addition of ubiquinin, ubiquinin will slow the off rate, will show increase more ubiquitins going on, and it'll increase the on rate. And you basically have a processive affinity amplification. So that's what, um, uh, so what does all this mean? Specificity is only partially encoded by the complementarity in the energetics of binding. That is, you only get a little bit that way. It's also encoded by a kind of kinetic complementarity related to the juxtaposition of reactive lysine groups to the active site. This juxtaposition in the absence of ubiquitin doesn't confer any thermodynamic stability, but instead confers specificity when they've reacted with the ubiquitin. And this is later turned into further binding affinity. Okay, so that explains uh, why it is that um, bad substrates, if they bind, don't get ubiquitated sufficiently to get degraded and come on and off very quickly, so we don't have to spend a lot of time plugging up uh, the enzyme. 
Okay, so uh, that's the main point. I want to come back to this at the end because I want to really think about um, uh, how this relates to a more general question of specificity in biology. This part of the talk, I, I is, um, if you've talked to Ying about his work, I probably could go through fairly quickly because and maybe it's, not, and that's really the question of, it's not over when the, it's been ubiquitated, it's only over for this protein when it's been degraded. So how does the, um, uh, how does the proteasome identify substrates to degrade them and not degrade them? What's the signal? Is it the number of ubiquitins on the molecule? Is it their configuration? Is it the length of ubiquitin chains? Because this is part of the whole story as well. Uh, lots of ways you can put ubiquitin on a protein, and, and we don't really know how the, how the proteasome is, uh, uh, sees these. Uh, and, you know, okay, so, so we were very, um, uh, we were very uh, taken by these single molecule measurements because we could really see kinetic features uh, with much more specificity than we could ever see in bulk. And so we went back to this question, and it was an idea that was uh, uh, by Cecile Picard, who was a real pioneer in this field, but she came up with the idea that there was a tetrahub ubiquitin um, uh, sort of uh, motif or, or, uh, or signal that if, a ch if there was a chain with four ubiquitins on it, that it would be degraded, and less than that, it wouldn't get degraded, or it wouldn't get degraded very fast. And uh, we can, we figure out chemically how to put ubiquitins of different configurations in different places on the proteins. I won't bore you with that. And we showed, in fact, that as soon as we looked, that at least for securin, two, two chain ubiquitins was better than one four chain ubiquitin for degradation. So, uh, Okay, so that, that so then we came to the and and uh, the question of how does it distinguish these ubiquitin configurations? How does it say that this is better than this, and most certainly much better than that? Um, so the affinity of the substrates. Once again, we're dealing with the fact that specificity is not just affinity, but it's something else. Both for this step in the reaction and also the previous step in the reaction. So, um, we, so it turns out that the binding of substrates to the proteasome uh, depends on the number of ubiquitins on the protein. Not, how, I, mean, uh, I mean, maybe at some s subtle level, but at least the, the first approximation, it doesn't matter whether they're in chains or they're single ubiquitins or how they're, the binding is just the number of the things. And, there are two general mechanisms that you can imagine uh, for binding. It could simultaneously bind, say, some number of ubiquitins to the proteasome in a very cooperative process. Uh, or it could just essentially, uh, the more ubiquitins it has, the more likely it is to uh, interact with a binding site on the protein. So this would be a stochastic um, uh, or a mass action process. And this is a cooperative process. And it needs to make very specific uh, predictions that this should be proportional to the binding constant to, uh, to the nth power, where n would be the number of, of cooperative units here. And this would be linear, n times the number of, n times the affinity constant. And we find that, uh, that the first few ubiquitins are, are, are linear in a log plot, and the last few ubiquitins are linear in a linear plot. So initially there's some multiples, multiple interaction, followed by, of course, the more ubiquitins you put on, the more likely you are to get that multiple interaction, so it's purely stochastic. Okay. Now the last thing about the whole thing is, so number of ubiquitins determines something, at least it gets you on the proteasome. The other is the translocation of the polypeptide chain into the channel, which then uh, degrades the protein. And it's that translocation step that we found is, uh, um, is sensitive to the chain configuration. 
And uh, this is just showing you, for example, that if we have, um, uh, if we, if we uh, put a certain number on the, the molecule, which can't make chains, then uh, there's going to be, uh, uh, y you know, that the, the number of ubiquins will go up, but the, 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 uh, the dwell time, well, the dwell time will also go up. But if you uh, look at the degradation, it will, uh, it'll, the degradation will certainly much, be much higher when you, um, you know, wild type, at least at this stage here. Maybe at very high levels, there's not such a difference. So it, it's, good, it's good to have, even though chains alone are, I mean, chains or not chains are fine for binding, um, for actual degradation, it requires something else. So we could show kinetically that the insertion of the peptide into the 20S channel is sensitive to the configuration of ubiquitin chains. And we could actually watch the protein go into the channel. And how can we do that? Well, uh, there's a deubiquinating enzyme just at the opening of the channel that cuts the ubiquitin chain right at the protein. So here we see this, this uh, pro protein in real time going through the channel and at first we see it lose a couple of ubiquinins, and then it loses a few more, and then it loses a few more. So you have this kind of step-like behavior, which is actually, actually allowing us to see the passage of this, uh, of this protein into the channel. And um, OK, so we've learned a lot, and we understand what's going on here, and that ubiquitin chains uh, of the same length and the same number of ubiquinins, but if they're in chains, they, uh, they, they, go, they enter the channel, and if they're not in chains, they don't enter the channel. OK, so we have these two hurdles of protein degradation, and they're both kind of dependent on a multiple step process. And they both uh, depend on uh, kinetic features. And um, why? Uh, what I'm going to say and, um, in all of this is uh, that this kind of Baroque mechanism uh, improves the trade-off between specificity and efficiency. So you have a reaction that you want to carry out in the, the cell, whatever it is, transcription or um, T-cell receptor or whatever you're trying to do. Um, you, can, you can do it fast, or, uh, or you can do it accurately. And, um, and Na biology is trying to balance the two against each other. I'll give you some evidence for that. In the case of the ubiquination, um, oops, anyway, chemical reactivity enhances binding, uh, the binding on and off rates. And degradation, as I say, is a two-step recognition process. The first step recognizes the bulk. The second step recognizes the configuration. OK, so I want to get to this last part, which I think maybe you know, might relate to some things that uh, some of you are interested in. Um, and that is this fundamental trade-off between accuracy and speed. I first confronted this problem myself because I took typing in high school. It was a lot of fun. I was, I think, the only boy in the class. And, you know, and, uh, uh, but I wasn't a good typist. And, uh, and so, um, and I complained to the teacher that I actually got most of the letters correct, you know, and I thought 90% should be an A. <laughs> but they don't look at it that way. <laughs> so, uh, and she, she also wanted us to take typing tests, which were faster and faster, and the faster it was, the more mistakes I made. So I learned, as everybody learns, that there's a trade-off between uh, accuracy and speed. I also learned that the trade-off is different for different people. For me, it was pretty mediocre. You know, I would, you know, I'd have to type very slowly in order to be very accurate. Whereas these, my other classmates there seemed to go at a blazing speed and never make any mistakes. So I think they had a different kind of biology that they were operating with. And, uh, and I think we ought to be thinking about this as well. How does biology maximize this trade-off? OK, so that there is a trade-off is very clear. Uh, so people look, in this case, at DNA replication and uh, in bacteria. And the question was, what's the cost, or what's the speed, let's say, 
and what's the error rate? And uh, they found that there's a certain speed and there's a certain error rate. And um, <coughs> that was, uh, so people wonder, well, was that sort of limit, uh, error rate limit, set by some physical chemical principle or something that you just couldn't, or chemical principle, you just couldn't do it any better. So they made mutants. And they can make mutants where the error rate was um, greater, more like me typing. Uh, but then the speed, I mean, uh, uh, the error rate was, uh, the, the, the speed essentially, this is actually just the speed, went down. And, uh, but then interestingly enough, oh, sorry, here, this, this, uh, it's going in the wrong direction. Here it is, the error rate, yeah, that's right. The, the error rate uh, goes up and the speed goes, uh, and the cost goes down. The speed goes up. And the, uh, but then they, um, they said, well, they made more mutants, and then they could actually make mutants with error rates far greater, uh, far, uh, far better, much lower error rates than these bacteria had ever evolved in the millions of years in there on the place of the Earth. But in all cases, and this was even shown more clearly with protein translation, where the exact same curves were obtained. In all cases, replication was, uh, was slower. So it, it appears then biology has not just gotten to the optimum error rate, it's traded off the error rate with the speed. So this was sort of something that happened years ago when, when elevators were first invented and people were afraid to go up in them. And then they had accidents, and people uh, didn't want to take elevators. So they, they built such intense uh, engineering, over, overbuilt them so that they wouldn't fall. Because you know one elevator crashing, and they will never build some other elevator. It wasn't that you know they could make them more and more safe. It was just a question of cost. And they were willing to pay the cost in the, in the early elevators. They're not willing to pay the cost. In automobiles, we could have automobiles today that would be much safer than they are, but it's just how much you want to pay for them. So biology is the same thing. It's not, there's no limit set by chemistry. You can get a better uh, error rate, but you'd have to pay for it by a slower speed. Now, John Hopfield and Jacques Nino thought about this in a clever way. They were thinking about both DNA replication and protein synthesis. And they came up with a very interesting scheme, which has never been proven to be correct in a simple kinetic model, but is undoubtedly correct based on the kind of behavior that exists. And that is, they said, well, is there some way we could put energy into a system and improve the error rate? Uh, so I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with kinetic proofreading? Is this? And OK, so um, maybe I'll give you a quick thing about the kinetic proofreading. If you're binding the wrong and the right amino acyl tRNA to the ribosome on the, uh, with, a, with the RNA there at some site, um, let's say they differ by 100-fold. That is, uh, the affinity is 100-fold greater for the right over the wrong. So then you'd expect to make an error 1% of the time. But if you bind that and then close the door so that nothing can bind again, which is in fact using ATP to make it an irreversible step, nearly irreversible step, and then wait, it turns out that the affinity is all due to the off rate. So what you get then is as you wait, the wrong one comes off 100 times faster than the right one. And if you wait long enough, you get another 100-fold enrichment. So by adding energy, you can take uh, something that has, would be a 1% error rate and make it a 0.01% error rate, which is closer to what, in fact, it is in translation. So uh, what he didn't point out uh, was that, of course, it's going slower and slower. Uh, you know, you've, you've, well, you've wasted 99% of the tRNA coming off in order for you to achieve that extra 100-fold increase in affinity. And you could, of course, Put the, make, cascade these things so you can get an arbitrarily uh, more, you can make it a, you know, another 100-fold and another 100-fold and another 100-fold. But each time you'd be selecting 1% out of the system and the thing would go slower and slower and slower. So it was both a good model for how um, 
uh, speed and uh, accuracy uh, are traded off in the system. So we, so Ying did these calculations and uh, with simple models based on known parameters. I'm not saying that they're all perfect, you know, but you can look at this dotted line here where we have efficiency, speed versus specificity, the trade-off that I showed you earlier, for simple uh, competitive inhibition. And then we could put on uh, 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 the kinetic proofreading model of Hopfield, and you could see that uh, for a given specificity, higher and higher specificity, the, uh, you, get, you have a better, if you want to get to, to some specificity, like here, uh, your efficiency is going to be higher with kinetic proofreading than it is with simple reactions. And uh, you'd have to have a really high, very big difference in affinity to achieve that. And our model of uh, processive infinity, uh, infinity amplification gives an even better trade-off than kinetic proofreading. That is, you get more efficiency for the same amount of specificity or vice versa. So, um, so that, and that's because there's a double feedback in that system, both in the on rate and the off rate. Now, the question we're very puzzled about, is there a, some sort of optimum? set by physics or information theory, or quantum mechanics or uh, something, which says that there is some limit of the trade-off between efficient. We know there's no limit if you're just looking for efficiency or you're looking for specificity, but this trade-off is what we want to optimize. And so we don't know the answer to that yet. But we've looked at that. Now, in our case, what we find is, of course, that the specificity features are built into the reaction network itself. So we needed some sort of model which takes into account all reaction networks. Now, we know that by driving chemical reactions with ATP, we can get uh, greater and greater efficiency. I mean, we can actually convert substrates more and more into uh, products, let's say. And we know that we can, uh, through things like kinetic proofreading or this recessive affinity application, we we'll put in more and more energy we can get greater and greater specificity. What we really want to know is uh, take energy out of this equation and ask what is, whether there's some optimum perfect efficiency versus specificity curve. So uh, this is our work in progress, and I just wanted to say it because uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but we've, we can begin to score, put this out with a simple maxwell demon model, but we actually need, I think, a smart Maxwell demon, but where there's a, they, they're not just um, evaluate what they have, but they can sort of look at the, uh, the history of what's, what's happened. But, uh, so here's a demon model. It, it, you know, they're the right and the wrong ones come by, and depending if it's right, is a reaction, and if it's the wrong one, it's, it's not. And, and basically, this is really um, um, the best estimator for whether the, the right or wrong is a, a sum of, of binding times that we use the total binding time as an estimator to distinguish the, these, these two different types. Okay, I'm gonna make that. Anyways, what we get out of this whole thing is an equation which looks better than it is, and, it, and which it basically shows that, um, that the efficiency and this specificity are inverse um, reciprocal, I mean, they're so reciprocally related. They give hyperbola, hyperbola of the type that I showed. Uh, and that A, B, and C are functions of energy dissipation in some way. And, um, uh, and Stan Leibler, in a very specific model for, um, for kinetic proofreading, not looking for a general model here, but also came up with something of this form. Uh, so uh, that's where we stand. I think it's a really interesting question because I think these sort of problems appear all through biology. So, okay. Um, so the efficiency is a, we're going to say the specificity and efficiency is constrained by some sort of universal trade-off that's independent of reaction details. That's what we think. In a given system, it's an inverse log relationship, and there is some um, indication of that from information theory as well. You get things that seem like this. 
Um, and we are trying to, with some simple assumptions that it all depends on enzyme substrate association and kinetic constant independent. Um, we want to know how far is bi our biological systems away from this trade-off, and what, and of course, we want to investigate those systems to see how they actually do it. Now, um, the last thing I want to say is the question for us to consider. Does this solution of the specificity problem, I put solution in quotes because we haven't solved it, and problem because you may not think it's a problem, um, extend other biological processes? So let's talk about transcription factors binding to DNA. And uh, let's also talk about protein kinases and phosphatases. Or let's talk about um, T cell rec uh, recognition. So in all of these cases, we have a low complexity sequence requirement. We have multiple interactions. We have complex pathways. And we have uh, reverse, reversible processes that are going on, and phosphates going on, the phosphatase taking off. Uh, in the case of, of uh, eukaryotic chromatin, we have acetylation and deacetylation, methylation and demethylation. Um, and and these, these are the kind of features, the same features we have in, uh, in ubiquitination. So I'm not going to try to speculate as to how these might work in these other systems, but I think uh, bears really looking at it carefully. So Ying is right here, so you don't have to look at his picture. And uh, he really uh, took this project on, both parts of it, and uh, I think brought us to a problem where we see this as a more general question. And uh, also we had the help of a bunch of other people who contributed to the work. And um, again, thank you for inviting me. This is a really interesting talk. I'm a little confused about. Um, I'm a little bit confused about the comparison between the uh, the PAA model and the kinetic proofreading. Because in kinetic proofreading, you can achieve arbitrary specificity if you just assume your delta G is arbitrarily large. But the beauty of the kinetic proofreading was that you can achieve the specificity at the cost of efficiency without having to have any large delta G. So are you assuming with the PAA model and the kinetic proofreading that there's the same free energy difference between the correct and incorrect substrate? Or is there, because it's a little confusing to me what the These delta were G is. Models. In, in kinetic proofreading, as in anything, uh, I mean, I mean in, in, you can achieve it without any kind of, if you want specificity, right. we should not have had a three-letter code. You right. know? We could have had a 10 letter, or, or, or for transcription, we could make a sequence that was big enough so it was unique in the genome, and then we could achieve specificity. But the, there are tremendous costs to that, which, uh, which we make it very inefficient. So what I'm, I'm saying is it's really the trade-off uh, that, um, that, that because the process of affinity amplification involves both an effect on the off rate, on the on rate and the off rate. The, the, the kinetic proofing model only is the off rate, which is the only thing really being used here. Then it is inherently, for a given set of parameters, inherently better trade off. Now, for if you want, I mean, you could set the parameters to give you arbitrary, as you point out, arbitrary specificity at the cost of efficiency. But if you want to look at the trade off between efficiency and specificity, that's constrained. And uh, I think. You know, we just picked some reasonable parameters to plot this out. But you're right, you could put it have a much higher affinity and then of course it'll be much slower and, and um, you know, you, you pay for it on that side. Do right, you want to add something again or no? Yeah. So I'm oh, sorry. You can you can ask. Oh, go ahead. So um, this is ubiquitin is also used for other types of um, signaling within the cell, and I'm just curious as to. I know this is kind of. I mean, it, for instance, it's it's a signal for for uh, autophagy, initiation yeah. of autophagy, right, right. and I'm just curious as to whether you think any of these principles apply to these other roles of ubiquitin, and how. Um, 
competitive processes, you know, like autophagy. I mean, for instance, we, we expressed a RFP ubiquitin in the cytoplasm of a cell, and we could see part of the RFP ubiquitin being turned over by, protea by the proteasome and part of it actually um, undergoing an aggregation process and, you know, ultimate degradation through an autophagosomal process. So I'm just curious as to whether um, how you think about um, there being parallel pathways for some of these molecules, like you know, these signaling um, mm. components. I, I know this is off topic yes, no, somewhat, it's, but. It's, it's reasonable. Um, well, first of all, you know, um, you will see a lot of ubiquitin on things where ubiquitin is stable. You know, so in other words, it's, 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 you know, you have to, you know, if, if you were trying to judge the importance by how much ubiquitin is there, if you have something where ubiquitin stays on there, that'll be, it'll show up, where in, in this case, in the reactions are typically fairly quick. I mean, it, it gets ubiquitinated, and then it gets degraded, and the ubiquitin comes off. So there's a huge flux going through the proteasome. And if you're looking at how much it's bound to the proteins, it'll be relatively low. And people, you know, um, when they look for uh, ubiquination in on their blots or something like this, they often don't see it unless they put a proteasome inhibitor in and try to accumulate, and that causes also other issues. But the question about the specificity for other processes, um, this is, uh, there are probably other ways to think about it, but in this process, it doesn't have to be chains of ubiquitin, but if there are multiple encounters, and if the uh, ubiquitin affected the either the off rate or the on rate or both, both as in this case, then you, you could build a greater specificity that way. In the case of um, phosphorylation, for example, which may be sort of a better model, I mean, where you basically have a, uh, a kinase puts on phosphate, often multiple sites on a protein, but you have a phosphatase there taking it off all the time. Um, at least in one case, with, with in the CDK1, it's been shown that uh, with another protein bound to CDK1, that um, it, it has affinity for the phosphorylated protein that it's just phosphorylated. So, uh, it, uh, so, so in a way, it, it, it gives you some of that effect. Um, so I, uh, it's also possible that ubiquitin uh, is put on proteins can interact with uh, other types of modifications to build specificity. But it's got to be some sort of multiple process, and um, and uh, it, it can't be re it can't just come back on without going through that process. It has to usually as it dissipates energy. So I don't know the answer what, what it will be. It may be very different from this. It's not ruled out. Okay. I have a question, probably a little bit off topic. So I'm an engineer. So in engineers, when you design all the systems, yeah. other than the efficiency and the you know the specificity, we also think about reliability. Uh, not necessarily the biochemistry level, yeah. but you know, is, is that does that come into the picture? For example, you know, if you had got something wrong, you know, how do you recover from the error and things like that? How does that come into the picture? Is is that relevant at all in, in biology? Um, I, got, I mean, first of all, I can say I never thought about reliability. Uh, of course, a lot of these systems themselves are part of reliability mechanisms. So that, you know, so that, I mean, uh, um, so I guess what does it mean, reliability? I mean, uh, uh, specificity is a form of reliability. I mean, can you rely on the system that you bind a transcription factor to making the RNA that you want? Um, but, um, what if the parts break? I think that's really what? Pardon? You mean the ubiquitin breaks in half, or the APC? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, what's the, I, what I mean, is, I mean but that's what it means in engineering mean, context, right? If one transistor breaks, how does the uh, rest of the system? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think uh, that probably depends on what the system is being used for. I mean, specificity has a lot of the reliability issues in it. You know, it's really about... I mean, how reliable is protein synthesis? How reliable is, uh, um, is really a question of specificity, but as far as, uh, it, yeah. It's a different with neurons, right? We live, let's say, on average 80 years. Yeah. The sample within the exon, for example, that's, that's the same for 80 years without much of a problem in the cell system. Right. To, to me, as an engineer, I think that's kind of the reliability. 
No, but, but I'm saying there are processes. I mean, uh, as Jennifer said, I mean, there's autophagy, for example. There's pro the proteasome will, will uh, uh, and chaperones will attack misfolded proteins. I mean, these are all part of reliability mechanisms. Uh, so there's definitely plot, lots of investment in biology in trying to, uh, you know, repair DNA damage, get rid of misfolded proteins. Uh, those are all, it's not that biology hasn't thought about reliability, it's just that I'm not quite sure in this context what to do with it, unless it's part of reliability. Yeah, so I, I was curious, I mean, do, do you think there's some possible analogy between what you're talking about and let's say like a cell cycle um, uh, checkpoints and this type of thing? So like, you know, I mean like, yeah, like in that case when you have some type of uh, problem, right, you know, you may have to wait some time in order to fix it and then maybe there's some like trade-off, but I don't know, if you, is there some analogy there potentially, do you think, or not? Um. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I think I'm, I'm more comfortable thinking about it in terms of this issue of specificity, but why this, the sequences are so small. The reason they're so small is because it allows you to, to um, rapidly um, assay or investigate many, 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 many things. And so lots of things you can bind and come off and bind and come off and bind and come off. If you want to make it specific and put a sequence that's really big on it, then it's going to bind tightly. And what's wor worse, let's say we have a sequence of N amino acids. It's just a perfect sequence because that N is the number where it only appears once in the, in the uh, proteome uh, or whatever, you know, sequence. So it, it binds tightly enough. But then so there's only one protein in there, one type of protein that, with those N amino acids. But how many are there with N minus 1? And how many are there with N minus 2? And how many with MI3? The numbers go up. And so you can imagine that there's a danger in making a big sequence because you're going to have inhibition from all these partial interactions. So I think what is the driving the system is a way of being, being very rapid, being very, very efficient, but at the same time um, uh, trying to be as accurate as possible and somehow using energy to make that m more and more accurate. And, um, and I think that's, um, uh, now when things fail, as you point out, you know, when you, you know, when you, uh, you, 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 you damage your DNA or something else like this happens, and, and then there are these other fallbacks, you know, or, or you know, the spindle is not assembled and properly and you don't go into mitosis. But I'm not quite sure that's the same thing I'm talking about. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's important. But it's not, it's not as well. uh, this is a detailed question. So the you have these two phases of ubiquitination. Yes. And I was wondering how those relate to the different E2s. Ah. That if you've got a purified system now, yeah, then yeah. Did, did you track that down? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, that's, a, that's a sort of insider question. Somebody who actually know, knows somebody who knows something about this process. Um, E2 is the enzyme that carries the ubiquitin to the enzyme that adds it to the protein. And there are two different kinds of E2s. One E2 will only add ubiquitin to already ubiquitinated proteins. It will not add it to the initial protein. And uh, the other will actually add ubiquitin to the initial protein. It will more slowly add ubiquitin to the ubiquitin. So we know the E2s in this system well. And uh, as you might expect, uh, the, the uh, second very slow reaction uh, will uh, be very, very slow if you're using just the E2 that adds the first set of ubiquitins on there. The second E2 will only work in that second step, but not so fast as the initial reaction rate. So it, it's slower, but it's faster than it would be if you just relied on that first kind of E2. I was wondering how that like, relates to the oxalate changing and the alginate changing. Is that because the I don't the E2 or the protein 2 is, is changed and there's different amino acids? No, I don't think so because, you know, the APC will come off and, uh, uh, um, I mean, it's, well, I, I don't really know, but I mean, it's, it's, it seems like that it's, it's possible that it's, uh, I don't know, do we, do we look at 
the effect of the two different E2s on on and off rates? Right. Well, well, we know the second E2 adds the, the second. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's not something we've looked at. Well, that's con contributing to the first on and off rates. So it seems like another consequence of squeezing specificity out of very short recognition sequences is that the evolutionary process can sort of bring them in and out of being much more quickly. So I just wonder what your thoughts are uh, about that. Um, I would consider that, uh, you know, it's always a question, you know, uh, uh, evolution biologists don't like mechanisms that will be useful in the future. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I think it's, uh, so I, I don't like to mention those kind of things to them, but it's, this is a different crowd. Uh, uh, but I think it certainly not, doesn't violate any laws of nature for things that are useful in the present to have some useful utility in the future. You know, there's a, they can be selected for the value they have today, and they can also at the same time enable what you just said. So I think that's really a very likely consequence of having these short uh, recognition sequences. Um, and uh, on the other hand, I want to make clear to everybody that there is other information here. And, and uh, I mean, there has to be other information. The information is not in the binding affinity, but in the placement of these lysine re residues. But I have a feeling that's not so hard to achieve. There are probably many, many solutions that will work. And they may only work partially, but allows you to then select upon those, those things. So I think it's quite an evolvable kind of process. Yeah, I guess it's another way to achieve context dependence um, specificity yeah. as well, to make this, you know, the same the specificity for the same protein in different contexts. Uh, right, right. And there's, you know, there's been plenty of examples of, of uh, phosphorylation and simulation sort of interfering with each other and things that, you know, so you can imagine that you can change the context. In this case, uh, for APC, it seems that like almost every substrate, it doesn't get modified uh, for its recognition APC. So it's, it's really about its inherent properties. But in other E2 enzymes, uh, modification, is the, 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 what, what the APC is, it's, it's on and off as an enzyme. And the substrates are not being regulated generally. Whereas in many other uh, e, you know, e, uh, E3s and E2s, you know, uh, the enzyme is there constitutively and substrate modification changes whether it gets degraded or ubiquitinated or not. Um, uh, I have a question. So um, uh, getting back, uh, getting to the topic of the specificity in error, right? So I'm curious about whether, um, first of all, the first question is that do people know the level of error that you can still, the system can ha still have uh, without being seen by selection? And the second question being that um, considering the error can actually sometimes be good by generating uh, variations that selection can act on. So in DNA, of course, the mutation rate, it's actually you can uh, change it, right? You, you there, there's a way to regulate it. So I'm curious about for, um, for like say ubiquitination system, do you see possibilities of actually regulating the error or specificity rate depending on the selection, I mean, the environment? Um, well, I mean, the mutation rate is, um, you know, is usually, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of fixed by whatever evolution is achieved. Yeah, the SOS, right? So the yeah, but then there's special mechanisms to, to do that sort of thing. Yeah, I have no idea whether there's a circumstance under which the uh, the uh, ubiquitination becomes more error prone. Uh, it could very well be, but I, I 